How is everyone on a Saturday afternoon? Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, there are um, so many people on, <laughs> 100 and, um, 850 something. And I think we're also uh, streaming this live on Facebook as well. So good afternoon to each and every one of you. Um, lovely to have you all join us on a Saturday afternoon. I'm just gonna share my screen and then we are going to get started. So um, today's session is on, as the title says, about sharpening the saw. And um, this is going to be not an academic session. I know that you all have been probably uh, attending a lot of programs on online um, teaching and how do we you know, deal with um, assessments and things like that. I just wanna make it very clear from the beginning that this session is just about you and you only. It's about sharpening your saw and this guided um, self-discovery um, on this presentation. I hope that by the end of it and continuing afterwards, you are gonna be able to develop your beautiful spectrum of human potential. Um, let me begin um, with something about myself that I'd like to share with all of you. I think that for um, ever, since I was a young girl, I think I've lived in the twain. Um, those of you who know about me, I was born and raised in the United States and I moved to India after getting married. I've been in education for uh, over 24 years. And uh, Rudyard Kipling had once said that East is East and West is West and never twain shall they meet. And um, I think that I don't agree with that because I feel ever twain shall the East and the West meet for me um, as, um, you know, an Indian, as an American, as a Muslim, you know, I, we all carry so many different identities about ourselves. And uh, one of the symbols that has really, really harmonized um, and what I have really resonated with is the yin and yang symbol. So here on the screen, um, in my introduction, I wanted to share with you a painting I did. I'm an amateur painter about the Indian flag and the American flag and how um, there is a harmony of us Indo-Western um, uh, persons. And um, the other painting that I have is um, the balancing of all the earth's elements, the uh, air, uh, fire, earth, water. Um, so that's just a little bit to start you off. Um, and let me just continue with um, a little bit about the yin and yang. And you'll see very shortly how it relates to um, my session that I'm gonna be sharing with you today. So the yin and yang symbol for me um, and others, it represents sort of a union of dualities. Um, I think it does a beautiful job of the way it um, is shown, how it harnesses different polarities. It balances different pairs. It synergizes um, two different concepts. And uh, I think that that's how I've always sort of operated I've always taken kind of the best of multiple different perspectives. Um, and in the yin and yang, it kind of represents um, the East, the West. Um, it represents the feminine, the masculine, um, the active, the receptive. Um, in education, I think it represents the head and the heart, the mind and the body. So um, today's session, we're gonna be kind of seeing um, a harmony of the habits, the seven habits, as well as our multifaceted um, intelligences. Another example from education that I kind of um, had done a little bit of a yin and yang was with um, psychology and education. And um, I was a student of psychology. Later on, I went into education. And I always found that it was very, very beneficial to rely um, on the psychological research, on neuroscience research, and then apply that into education. And um, a few years ago, I came up with a book called The ABCs of Brain compatible learning. Now, um, the two um, 
aspects that I'm going to be talking about today is the theory of multiple intelligences. Um, this was a theory, I think you all know it very well if you're in education, um, devised by Dr. Howard Gardner um, back in 1983 when he wrote Frames of Mind. What I love about this theory is that um, it's really beautiful because when we talk about somebody being smart, and remember here we're talking about you all right now, it's about your smartness and your intelligence. So when we say somebody's bright, somebody's smart, like what do we mean by that? And I think the best example is like through this prism. When we see intelligence representing as a white light, passing through that prism and then out on the other end comes this you know entire spectrum of different hues and that's kind of how like your intelligence is that's how your competencies are um, they are very very multifaceted and we can develop and each one is very distinct from the other at Glendale Academy, we had the great pleasure of having Dr. Howard Gardner, the father of multiple intel intelligence himself, um, visit our campus back in um, 2012. Um, what I also love about this theory is that more than any other theory, it actually develops that entire full spectrum of human potential. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to be talking about how is it that you can develop your full spectrum of uh, human potential with the habits and with the intelligences. The other one that I am really um, you know, excited about to share with you is one of my favorite authors, um, Stephen Covey. And um, I had read uh, very shortly after getting married, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I found um, what I learned from that book so um, powerful, so moving. In fact, whatever work I continue doing in education, um, really, really, um, I was inspired in so many different ways uh, by what The Seven Habits had to share. So I'm gonna jump to the seventh habit of the seven habits right away, because I wanna give you a context for what this presentation, this webinar is all about. It's about, as the title says, sharpening your saw. So those of you who are already familiar with seven habits, um, that's great, it's gonna be a quick review for you. But those of you who have never heard of the seven habits, um, let me just take a few moments to explain what it is. So sharpen the saw is um, the seventh habit and it's really about preserving and enhancing the greatest asset that you have. And that means that's you. And it's about having a very balanced, systematic um, program for self-renewal in um, the different aspects of our life, our physical, our mental, our social, emotional, and our spiritual. And when we don't do this, when we don't take out time for this, um, discipline of sharpening our saw, the body, it becomes weak, the mind becomes mechanical, the emotions become raw, selfish, and the spirit just becomes very insensitive. And the story is based on um, kind of a woodcutter who had the task of, you know, um, sawing down this, you know, huge tree. And, you know, he was working really hard. He was sawing away, sawing away. And what happens when you use a blade continuously, it becomes dull. It becomes a little ineffective. And when somebody walked by and he said that, you know, you're sweating, you're tired, um, and you still seem to have a long way to go, why don't you just take out a moment and sharpen your saw? And the woodcutter was like, I can't, I have to get this done. So sometime in the pressure to get things done, we keep going at it with kind of a dull um, blade a dull saw and that actually it makes us more ineffective and it gets us more tired. So it's very um, good to take out some time and sharpen our saw. And this is kind of the gist of what this um, presentation is about. Um, the sharp, sharpen the saw is also lovely because um, it's all about, um, you know, what people are talking about right now in these VUCA times, you know, volatile, um, uncertain, uh, complex and ambiguous times that we're living in. We don't know what the next week, the next month is going to hold for us because things keep changing um, so fast and people keep talking about reimagining, um, rethinking, redefining and really sharpen the saw. I think it really covers all those aspects, but people are talking about it in terms of their business or their profession or 
whatever their home life. So we're here to talk about what this sharpening the saw would mean for you as a person, because you are the most important person for you in your life. And it's very, very important that we take care of ourselves and you can take care of you. Um, and we can, you know, refresh ourselves, revisualize ourselves, resharpen ourselves, um, restart, reshape, um, reset, relax, um, and um, relearn. You know, after all, Alvin Toffler, um, he was a futurist of the last century. He said that the illiterate of the 21st century is not going to be one who can't read or write. Rather, it's going to be one who can't um, learn, unlearn, and relearn. So that's what we're doing today. So um, we are all um, creatures of habit, um, right? It's said that first you make your habits, and then your habits make you. And if we're not aware, then what's going to happen is that we inevitably fall into this sort of numb zone and then we feel down, we feel uninspired, we feel tired. And then very soon what happens is our routines, they become into ruts and then we need kind of help in getting out. So one of the beautiful quotes um, in uh, Seven Habits that um, we really got inspired in our group of educational institutions is a quote by Samuel Spiles that Covey talks about in Seven Habits. And that is, but when you sow a thought, you reap an action. When you sow an action, you reap a habit. So the actions that we take place, that is what is going to, you know, help you um, create those habits. And then when we sow a habit, um, we reap a character. And then when we sow a character, we reap a destiny. The rhythm of living just a holistic life. Um, instead of repeating limited behaviors, limited habits that hold you down, um, hopefully with this presentation, you're going to be able to discover new creative ways to live and love more fully. And sometimes, sometimes some of the smallest and simplest changes can actually cause um, catalyze, you know, profound shifts for all of you. And um, hopefully this is going to be a time most of you are in the summer break right now. Uh, maybe those of you who are joining from different parts of um, the world, perhaps not, but in India, most of the teachers are off for the summer. So it's a great time for you to recreate yourself um, and sort of court your playful spirit. Okay, so I'm going to do like a quick um, few minutes recap on the seven habits just to create a context because when I share the rest of the presentation those of you who are not familiar with the habits might become a little lost. So habit number one is to be proactive. Understand that um, you're in charge, you can we can carry our own weather, um, we don't have to be a victim of circumstance, Covey says in his book, um, we need to recognize the space between stimulus and response. We need to exercise control, not over our circle of concern, but rather our circle of influence. And as Gandhiji said, we need to be the change that we wish to see in the world. Habit number two is, habit number two is to begin with the end in mind, have a plan. And um, Kavi talks about having, um, all things are basically created twice, he says. First, there is a mental creation, and then there is a physical manifestation of that creation. So we all have to be visionary for our own lives. We all have to begin with that end in mind. Third habit is to put first things first. And what Kavi says in his book is that he says that things that matter the most should never, ever be at the um, mercy of those that matter the least. And he says that the first the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing in our life. So those three habits, the first three habits are really what constitute your private victory. And after that, four, five, and six, these are um, about your public victory and how you are with others. So habit number four is to have an abundance, abundance mentality and think win-win, right? Um, understand uh, that there is abundance out there. And if, um, you know, one person wins, it doesn't mean necessarily that somebody else loses. And we're an interdependent reality. And we all have to kind of seek that third alternative. Habit number five is to seek to first understand and then be understood. 
And um, I think most of the world's problems in the microcosm or the macrocosm are communication problems. And we need to have empathy and we need to listen before we speak. Habit number six is to synergize. I love this word. Um, synergy is everywhere. We see it in nature. Uh, sorry, there's something that happened to my screen. Um, so together is better. Um, and together, one plus one doesn't equal two. It actually equals three or more. So we need to harness um, that synergy and that cooperation with one another. And again, coming back to the topic of our um, presentation today is sharpen the saw, investing in yourself and understanding that that's the best investment. And that's going to make you better for yourself. And it's going to be better for those around you. It's going to be better for the work that you do in your personal life and your professional life. Now, later on, um, Stephen Covey, he um, wrote another book called The Eighth Habit. And The Eighth Habit is also very, very nice um, because it's about finding your voice and inspiring others to find theirs. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that later, too. So that's a recap of all, not just seven habits, but even the eighth habit. OK, now in this slide, I'm going to take you back to the introduction when I introduced the yin and yang symbol and what it meant for me in my life. And in this presentation, you're going to see how I combined two elements and how I synthesized these two elements and um, created this presentation to help you. Um, this is about the eighth habit, the eight habits and the eight intelligences as well. Okay, so now um, uh, this is an important habit and I think this is where we sort of um, left off. Um, I was tying back in when I had done the introduction to the symbol of yin and yang. And this is how I've kind of combined and synergized two concepts, which is the habits and the intelligences, both topics um, that I'm extremely, extremely um, passionate about. Um, I love uh, both of these topics. I've worked with them for um, over two decades. I've seen great, great value in them, um, not only for myself and my personal life, but also my professional life um, in the lives of my teachers, uh, my faculty, my students. Um, we've adopted the Leader in Me program at our school. Um, we were pioneers in establishing the methodology of multiple intelligence um, more than 20 years ago. So I'm super, super passionate about both of these um, topics. And um, for today's session, we're gonna see how we can kind of harmonize um, both. So, uh, oops. So now um, I'm sharing this screen with you um, to show you, imagine this is kind of like a blank um, spectrum right now, okay? And if I were to ask all of you, if you were to take a look at these eight intelligences in yourselves and just kind of think about it and take a couple of minutes to sort of ponder, what would you put down as your competencies and your strengths under each of these? under verbal linguistic, under visual spatial, musical rhythmic, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, naturalistic, um, logical, mathematical, intrapersonal, and existential as well. Okay, um, so let's start now with intrapersonal intelligence. And this is about how is it that we are self-smart? So you're gonna wanna ask yourselves a few questions. And we wanna ask ourselves, how is it that I can develop my own self-efficacy as a continuous lifelong learner? How is it that I can set fulfilling goals for myself? How is it that uh, I can incorporate mindfulness in what it is that I do? So let's start with these questions and also understand that there is a lot of talk right because of this lockdown, you know, we're reassessing what is important to us. You know, we're taking this time to reflect. Um, we're taking this time to what it is that we spent our time on before and how is it now? Am I using my time wisely? So in this introspection, um, when we look at this intelligence of intrapersonal intelligence of ourselves with the sharp and the saw as a habit, what are the things that we can do to optimize both? 
Well, I think that we are in a country that knows meditation very well. Um, mindfulness is a buzzword these days. And also reflection is extremely important. Um, now, these are things, great practices to involve ourselves with on a daily basis. It's like a muscle that you keep working at and you be, make it a little bit more stronger, a little bit more effective the more you practice it. Um, but what are some other things that we can actually do to increase sort of our emotional agility? Um, personally, for me, I love journaling. Uh, when I journal, I see um, so much growth. It's like you can be your own best friend and um, you can learn, you go back and you see that, okay, you know, this was this issue at this time. Does it have that much importance now? Or this continues to be something that I increasingly work towards. Um, there's journals that you can do freehand writing. There's journals that come with journal prompts and it helps you to sort of, you know, process different things in your life. So I, I love both. I've also done um, something with Rudolf Steiner's um, biography work. And that's kind of looking at your life in different septennials, like, you know, zero to seven, eight to 15, et cetera. And um, that's also been powerful. You can take um, a snapshot of the screen. You can look up biography work uh, later on if you'd like to pursue that. There's also something called neuro-linguistic programming. When you want to reset things for yourself, you can look into that. But in essence, intrapersonal intelligence, when we look at it to sharpen our saw, it means to basically connect to our higher self and to be able to go beyond the ego mind. Because you know our mind, though it is such a valuable asset to us, sometimes it may not work for us in the right way. So we need to kind of step us outside of ourselves and kind of be a witness to what it is that we are thinking, what it is that we're feeling. That's what I mean when I say connect to our higher self. We need to go beyond that ego mind and look at this what's happening in our life. Look at ourselves kind of in this sort of witnessing presence. So I read a lot of books, whether it's um, different scriptures, whether it's um, new age, you know, psychology, the power of now, Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra. I mean, all of them, they all basically talk about this. Rumi as, um, uh, you know, a spiritual person, he talks about this uh, all the time. Now, um, so sorry, these are some, um, so I have actually um, curated um, uh, some apps uh, that can help you if you wanna try out um, some visualization, um, some meditation, some guided visualizations, if you wanna try out journaling, there's actually a lot of apps that are available and I'm sharing some of those um, for you to try out. Okay. Next, I'm going to talk about verbal linguistic intelligence. So the questions that you want to ask yourself is, how is it that I can improve my communication? How is it that I can better um, express myself in person, in writing? And now we have, you know, digital formats um, in which we can express ourselves. I mean, who there is not so many webinars um, before this lockdown, but this is another way that we can connect and, you know, share information. Okay, so when we look at verbal linguistic intelligence in the light of the habits, what I found is that we can take some people have a lot of free time on their hands, some people are saying that they're just as busy as ever. So you know how busy you are, and you will be able to decide how is it that you want to sharpen your saw. But this is a great time where you can actually improve your verbal and your written expression. Communication is something that, you know, is developed over a lifetime, right? Um, but we can always make what we say more powerful when we use a quote. Like I have quotes on most of the screens that I'm sharing with you, whether I'm talking about the habits or I'm talking about um, the intelligences. So the quotes kind of, you know, give more power to what it is that you say. Um, same thing with proverbs and idioms. They give you more power with what you say. It gives more weightage to your words. Um, when you can back up what you say with research, sound research and facts, 
that also gives a lot of power. And then of course, there's creative writing, um, there's poetry, um, there's lovely, lovely ways that we can continuously over a lifetime um, improve our verbal and our written expression. Now, in terms of being proactive, uh, you can use the verbal linguistic intelligence to actually advocate um, very, very easily in this day and age. Um, when we talk about being proactive, we also talk about um, exercising um, our competency in our circle of influence, right? So everyone has a large circle of concern. Oh, there's pollution and there's this and there's that. But what is in your circle of influence? Um, what is it when you can share in person uh, now, you know, it's it's limited because of social distancing, but what you can share on the digital um, platform, um, either it could be not just posts and tweets, uh, but maybe even blogs, uh, maybe even articles. And how is it that you can actually, or maybe even, you know, take a webinar, how is it that you can advocate for the things that are important for you, the things that you are passionate about, and how is it that you can, you know, increase your circle of influence with that. Um, I took a course in college and it was called um, Communication in the Human Condition. And really words are so powerful. And um, what we speak uh, creates the human condition around us. Um, words are really, really powerful. Words can make or break relationships. Um, words um, define everything that is around it. It defines the human condition. So how we speak and how we express ourselves is extremely important. When we take a look at verbal linguistic intelligence in relation to the other habits, um, well, habit number five, first seek to understand and then be understood is all about listening skills. Um, so getting back to habit number five, I talked about how that's really important. And then when we look at verbal linguistic intelligence in terms of um, sharpening the saw, um, this is a great opportunity where during the lockdown, there are so many um, very, very renowned libraries all over the world, um, New York. Um, they have actually opened up their entire um, range of uh, books. The digital library is open for anyone to uh, consume. There is uh, many pub uh, publishers that have been able to do that as well. So if you would like to read and reading um, you know, makes you smarter. Um, reading is great. Books, articles. Um, uh, now we have things on Kindle. So some things, if you can't order on Amazon uh, now because of the delivery delay, you can actually, you know, download them on your Kindle. But aside from that, you can consume it through the net because they're accessible um, with links. Um, I personally like an app called Blinkist. And um, Anytime there's a very popular book and people are talking about this book um, and I don't really have time to really read it, but it's intrigued me enough where I want to actually find out about it. Um, you can actually uh, look it up on Blinkist. Um, you have to do you do have to pay for that app, but it gives you like a 12 page approximately um, summary of the entire book. Like I remember everybody was talking about Sapiens a few years ago and, um, you know, we just uh, uh, I, I just looked at it on Blinkist. Okay, so what is it that we can actually do? I talked about um, verbal linguistic intelligence in relation to um, the habits, um, but what we can actually do is now there's a lot of TEDx um, uh, events. Um, I've actually done a TEDx myself. Um, there's um, speaking apps. We can um, increase um, our efficacy in how we speak publicly. Um, there's Toastmasters, we can put away like worn out vocabulary um, and, you know, we can improve our vocabulary. There's also, um, you know, ways in which we can improve just our writing style. Um, and there's a couple of examples for you all to um, look into. I personally um, really find um, etymology very um, uh, interesting because um, I remember when I was a young girl, they used to talk about the Latin roots of words. And I was like, mm, why do they do that? And later on, I had taken a course called Landmark Forum. And in that, it was about, you know, making decisions and going through with those decisions. And then he talked about the the etymology of decide, you know, and side, um, C-I-D-E, it comes from the word um, death or to eliminate. 
something like you would see in pesticide, insecticide, homicide, you know, it's to kind of kill. Uh, so deciding is to kill any other um, uh, option and to just kind of go ahead with it. So the power of deciding became so much stronger when I understood the etymology of the word, you know, uh, decide. So um, also this is kind of an example of a journal prompt um, that I had done. Uh, this is about six years ago. And the prompt was about uh, identifying if you could only salvage one item from your personal treasures, what would it be and why? And I wrote about, you know, salvaging a memory drive of all my photos that captured significant events of my life. And then when I was now in the process of I'm making a um, 25th anniversary uh, coffee table book because it's coming up in a few months and I'm actually consolidating, you know, 25 years of, you know, memories. And I look back on this journal and I was like, wow, you know, this is why it's so important to me because all of these experiences have made me who I am. And when I journaled about it, when I wrote about it, you know, it crystallizes these experiences, you know, for me. And also what happens is that this happens when I also write an article about something, say I attend um, a program at Harvard or whatever, and I come back and I write about it and I need to share the essence of it. In the process of writing that article, it always helps me crystallize all my thoughts because it was about the learning, but then it was also about the application and the vision that you have for you know, its implementation. So now we come to our visual and spatial intelligence. Um, how is it that I can increase my creativity? We need to ask ourselves, how can I increase my um, aesthetic sense? How can I make time to learn or enjoy a new art form perhaps? How can I harness the power of visualization? And this is something that I learned maybe 15 years ago, um, but it's, it's very, very powerful. So when I look at the habits um, in relation to the visual spatial intelligence, this is what I see. I see that um, if we're going to be proactive, it always, always starts um, to be kind of, you know, zen in our environment, uh, have, have a clutter-free, distraction-free sort of environment. Um, we want to be organized. We want to be aesthetically appealing, um, spatially suave in the space that we're working in. And that makes uh, it just a better feel for us, a better energy, a better flow of chi for us in our environments. Um, and in habit number two, um, visualization is really important. And Shakti Givain wrote a book called Creative Visualization, and it was really powerful. I was introduced to it in a workshop um, that I had attended. And um, guided visualizations now with those apps that I had shared with you in interpersonal intelligence, those are beautiful. There's so many guided a wonderful um, apps that are out there. I was recently doing one with Deepak Chopra and it was a 21 day abundance um, meditation. And um, again, for sharpen the saw, um, what we can do is we can learn new art forms, we can paint, we can sketch, we can do photography. Um, one of my friends um, who is in the Telugu film industry, her son, he did this lovely like, you know, quarantine kind of times and you know, just filmed his entire house with such a different, unique um, perspective. As it was as if a, you know, a filmmaker was filming, you know, um, and it just helped you see something that you normally don't see. I mean, it was really because of the way that he filmed it. Um, there's animation, there's sculpting, there's pottery, there's so many things. What's really interesting is I'm going to talk about studio habits. Um, and that's something that I learned at Harvard at Project Zero. And it's called studio thinking. And in studio thinking, they have done years and years of research, um, these professors and researchers and educators, and they have found that the arts develops eight habits of mind that normally um, would not be able to get developed in academics. And um, the arts actually help us in so many uh, wonderful ways. And this is at a time when, you know, there was a lot of funding in the West that was being cut for either physical education or for the arts. So usually when push comes to shove, it's usually those right brain frills that are kind of eliminated from the schedule, um, thinking that it's not so important. But this book, Studio Thinking, it showed how these eight habits of mind of just observing, you know, just try to sketch something once, just try to paint something once. When you 
look at the way the light is falling, you know, all those intricate details in what it is that you're observing. It heightens your observation skills. Um, you learn the art of engaging and persisting, envisioning. You, you, you reflect because it's a very mindful activity when you're doing. You develop that craft. You express yourself in different ways. You stretch and you explore. And, you know, you can appreciate and understand the arts community more when we do that. There's an article on the side that talks about, you know, how, um, you know, art helps an individual holistically as well. This is something that I'd like to share from my personal experience. Um, after exams, um, my niece was staying with me for, you know, um, a couple of weeks and she wanted to sort of, you know, go into my little art space and just paint with me. And I was like, okay, um, let's do that. What should I paint? And um, I had taken a painting class many years ago. And I remember the sequel to that was basically imitating different um, famous artists work and trying to replicate it. And I remember hearing about a painter called Mondrian and he uses these primary colors that you see. I said, hmm, that's really nice. I was inspired by Mondrian. And then I started seeing his um, sort of influence in art uh, not just art, but um, art expressions, right? In interiors, in fashion. Um, and it was really, really interesting. And then, um, you know, I said, hmm, this is easy enough. I should kind of try to replicate that. And I, and I did it in just like one sitting. Um, and uh, I also were designing a design thinking lab um, whenever school opens up after the lockdown. And I've chosen the Mondrian kind of um, uh design for our design thinking space uh, for the maker space in our school lab so this is a different this is a way where when we are culturally literate and we understand different artists around it when we see it we can recognize it we can appreciate you know their influence into you know different aspects of our life um, i personally love monet there's a picture of me at the metropolitan museum in new york and um, every time I go to any museum, for that matter, I always take pictures of the Monet because I love Monet. I love his impressionist um, style. And it's something that I want to probably next time she comes to stay with us, I'd love to, you know, do a little Monet. But I wanted to just share with you, um, I, I never really learned how to do watercolors, but I was just trying my hand in it. And um, I, when I sat down with another couple of sittings with my niece, I did a match. And I did um, a tomb, uh, you know, we, we live in Hyderabad and it's the Khutub Shai tomb. So I can see it actually from our balcony. And I just kind of tried my hand on that just in a very amateur way. After I did the match, uh, I wanted to um, find a nice quote with it. And I said that if you have knowledge, let others light their candles in it. And I hope that the session is gonna be like that for you. Um, this is knowledge that I've kind of compiled over the last, you know, um, 20 plus years. It's been so, it's brought so much enrichment in my own life. Um, I, I hope it's brought a lot of enrichment into other people's life. And that's how it is. If we have knowledge as an educator, as a teacher, we need to let others light their candles in it. That doesn't diminish the light within us. You know, uh, it helps us to shine brighter when we can actually do that. So as you can see, this is something that I'm trying to sort of cultivate in myself, um, my visual spatial intelligence. In terms of apps, now, ne not necessarily do you have to, you know, do some painting, drawing, sketching, if that's not your thing. Um, if you want to just improve the space around, I know there's a lot of people who are watching Tidying Up by Mary Kondu. Um, that's really popular on Netflix. Um, they're taking this lockdown time to quite kind of organize um, their homes, their closets, their environments. Um, that's also very, very therapeutic. But how you organize things, um, you know, there's a lot of apps. Um, if you want to improve your environment, there's a lot of interior apps. Um, I mentioned to you earlier that I'm working on scrapbooking. So scrapbooking is not only a um, verbal linguistic sort of exercise, but it's also a visual spatial exercise. I'm personally not using any of these apps. But I'm working with a graphic designer that's helping me um, with the technical aspect of it. These are some other apps. If you want to learn um, sketching, if you want to learn drawing, zentangling, mandala creation, pattern making, um, these are some apps. There's also apps for photography and movie making um, that are really interesting. A lot of us have 
you know, features on our, our phone, um, even if you don't go through an app, but um, we can have a lot of fun with this. Um, there's so many different things that we can do. And I, I just love the arts. I'm not good at it, but I just love the arts. I'm, I'm an amateur, I'm an aspiring artist. Um, so musical rhythmic intelligence. Um, now this question that we would have to ask ourselves for our guided self-discovery is, how is it that I can learn to enjoy or optimize music, singing, poetry, or maybe even learn a new instrument? So in reflection with the habits, oops, I went ahead. In reflection with the habits, um, I would uh, ask ourselves, what type of music, um, what type of lyrics, what type of melody, what type of sounds, it could even be natural sounds, you know, from nature, what type of sounds rejuvenate my spirit? Um, you know, how is it that I can utilize um, the calming or the energizing effect of music? Um, how can I use music to enhance what I'm doing professionally? what I'm doing uh, personally in my, in my personal projects. Um, there's a lot of um, lovely pizzazz that, you know, uh, a great music or um, melody can add to even like say a PowerPoint. Um, when I hear Deepak Chopra's 21 day um, meditation, um, there's always this very soothing music. Sometimes it's musical, sometimes it's like natural sounds in the environment that really add to that guided um, visualization. There's also um, a lot of evidence to um, uh, share that cognitively, it's very, very um, strengthening for your brain to learn how to play an instrument. And there's a lot of uh, documented evidence um, because when we look at neuroscience um, scans of our brain, when somebody's learning on how to play an instrument, maximum parts of our brain light up. It's a very, very cognitively um, sort of strengthening um, uh, activity to engage in when you learn on how to play an instrument. And um, I was talking with a friend yesterday um, and she was sharing how during the lockdown, her mother-in-law is learning how to play the piano for the first time in her life from her son. So the grandson is teaching grandmom. So not only is it a musical rhythmic uh, lovely experience, but it's also a lovely, you know, intrapersonal uh, experience. Um, just imagine that bonding between the grandson and the grandmother. So um, there's different ways in which you can uh, exercise that. And if we have time this summer, why not? Um, mnemonics has always been a tool that I've talked about in education for memory enhancement. Uh, mnemonics is um, a lovely thing. And then of course, there's a lot of poetry and musical metaphor. When we say words or phrases like, you know, be in tune, strike a chord, um, how do we orchestrate a lovely, you know, teaching experience? Um, how do we have harmony in our relationships? It's all about, um, you know, with that music uh, metaphor. Sunil, can you please uh, take care of those marks, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here are some apps that were curated um, to maybe help you uh, along. There's a lot of digital piano, digital uh, keyboarding instrument apps. Um, we can also find apps for singing and recording. So um, one of our teachers, um, she uh, loves to sing and I saw her you know, uploading um, songs uh, that she sang on Smule. And so those people who would love to sing, I see a lot of that in my news feed, you know, different uh, friends, I'm locked down, they're, they're, they're exercising their vocal cords and uh, revisiting singing. Um, not only does it have to be um, a song or, you know, lyrics and mu music, poetry is also something that falls under our music rhythmic intelligence. So, um, this is a poem that I had penned down recently. Um, I was talking about with, um, you know, uh, one of my friends about how guilt is such a, um, you know, thing that sort of weighs on me sometimes. I find that when I'm trying to sharpen my saw, sometimes I feel a little bit of guilt, like, oh, but there's so much work and something that I need to work through. And she had suggested, well, why don't you just, um, you know, you don't want to let guilt go because guilt has work for you. Um, it's, it's, it's given you, you know, some, that's why it's not leaving you. So why don't you just write a poem and say, 
thank you to your guilty friend and let it go that yes, you served me once, but now you don't need it. And I kind of, it was all about how I was going to take time to schedule more me time and how I acknowledge what guilt had served, how, how it had served me and how I, I perhaps don't need it anymore. Uh, so let's see, naturalistic intelligence. Um, how is it that we can be more nature smart? I think one of the greatest benefits to this lockdown is that we are seeing the earth sort of just um, recuperate and um, renew itself. Um, you know, I think that we all as human beings have realized, you know, the impact, the negative impact that we were making on the earth. And now, you know, the animals have returned, the birds are chirping, the air is cleaner. Um, people who live off the coast, they see, you know, different, you know, creatures have come back. It's, it's just really, really beautiful how the earth is sort of just um, um, renewing itself because of the lockdown of human activity. But let's ask ourselves, because if we can realize that we've really done a lot of great um, damage to the earth, how is it that we can become more in tune with nature? How is it that we can become more environmentally conscious? Um, I think we don't have a choice. We have to live sustainably. We need to understand that we can't go on the way things were. Um, how is it that we can reduce our carbon footprint? This is really important. So when I look at naturalistic intelligence in the light of um, habits, first and foremost, what strikes me is how I learned the entire nature metaphor from Covey himself. I never really paid attention to it. Um, when he talked about things like the law of the harvest, he talked about how we can't cram at the farm. Um, if you want to reap a harvest, we need to do things, you know, with a certain time, have patience, do all the right things, nurture it, cultivate it, only then can we reap a harvest. And he talked about looking at that nature metaphor of the law of the harvest and bringing that into our own lives, bringing that into our relationships. You can't cram uh, uh, this kind of little uh, shots into relationships. They need to give you need to give it time. We can't do that in true education. You can cram for an exam and maybe get through, but would you as a result of it have um, gotten that type of knowledge and wisdom that um, you should have ideally? So the nature metaphor, I, I, I thank uh, Stephen Covey uh, for that. I shared with you already the uh, sow and reap uh, uh, quote. Um, so uh, an action, you reap a habit. So let's start, you know, action with some of these things and hopefully they'll become you know lovely habits uh, for us. Um, habit number one, um, I think that if we were to exercise our circle of influence um, to build this naturalistic intelligence, we need to understand that we need to be part of the solution and not part of the pollution. I think this is something that I've tried to emphasize in education um, for over 20 years. And I think that people are now realizing like enough is enough. We just need to live sustainably. Do we need all these things? Do we need to generate so much waste? Um, you know, we just need to live closer to nature. And in terms of sharpen the saw, whatever it is that we're doing for ourselves, whether it's food that we're eating, um, the materials that we're using um, in our homes, nature nurtures. Um, anything that is artificial, man-made, is somehow or another going to give us some negative um, side effects. Um, even the webinar, when we're speaking, I mean, there's a lot of electromagnetic radiation. Um, you know, so it, it has, um, you know, it's not, but nature is something that just nurtures us. Nature is something that sustains us. And I think that the more in tune we get to that, the better it is for us. So these are a few things from the net. Um, that we found there's nature apps, um, discovering nature, or even just listening to those nature relaxation sounds that I was mentioning a little bit earlier. Um, there's a lot of wildlife parks um, and even aquariums, I believe, that have given um, access um, to uh, uh, them. So you can actually remotely from your home enjoy a wildlife um, sanctuary or trip to the aquarium and see the jellyfish. And that also is supposed to be a kind of a meditative experience. 
Um, they say that um, there's a lot of articles that even if you spend as little as 20 minutes in nature, it's going to help you calm you down, center yourself. There's a lot of health benefits when um, we do that. There's a lot of health benefits for not only us, but for our children when we just spend some time in nature. And really, can we sharpen our saw? Can we have that you know, cup of tea, you know, um, on the lawn or on our balcony um, with some plants around us, you know, you know, now that the air is cleaner, you know, soaking up that fresh air, getting out of, you know, the indoors, um, or if you were in AC, you know, just being outdoors, it's really, really, really therapeutic. These are some uh, pictures that I actually took myself. Um, so uh, up here is when I went to KBR Park here in Hyderabad. Um, you know, you get lucky sometimes and you see peacocks uh, along the trails. So there's this peacock sitting so pretty and I love peacocks and I love the colors of the peacock. And my interior theme is peacock colors and peacock inspired. Um, and this is a picture that I took of some lotuses blooming in um, a pond. Um, this is another picture of just the sky looking so brilliant. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, 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 the clouds look lovely. The sunset looks so beautiful. Um, just me sitting on my roof, uh, um, just enjoying a cup of tea is just something the way I connect to nature. So moving to bodily kinesthetic intelligence, um, we need to ask ourselves, how is it that we can incorporate our uh, bodily kinesthetic activities and sort of optimize our body's potential, our gross motor skills. Uh, but not only that, but what about our fine motor skills? How can we become more dexterous um, in our handiwork? And, you know, I have, um, you know, an autoimmune condition called rheumatoid arthritis. So sometimes I struggle with a lot of pain in my hands. And I realize that all of, of the things that um, I was drawn to whether it was art or you know cooking or something like that they all had to do with my hands and I just really felt so much gratitude for though I had limited mobility um, and limited strength in my hands but just the fact that I could still use my hands and how hands are so uh, important is something that I just became so um, attuned to and grateful for. And sometimes, you know, we don't realize our health while we have it. I mean, health is wealth. Um, now everyone is so scared in this pandemic about their health and taking precautions. But when things are normal, it's very easy to sort of neglect our bodies, neglect our nutrition, neglect our health, our immunity, everything. So there's so much out there um, that talks about, you know, when you use your body, you know, it makes you happier, not just, you know, healthier. Um, when I look at Sharpen the Saw, um, there's so much uh, out there that you can still do to keep fit. I know there's a lot of memes about how um, people are getting fat, sitting in their home and eating too much. But there's a lot of creative ways that even families can exercise together, um, you know, if you don't want to do it on your own. So exercise, nutrition, fitness, really important. But let's also think about performing arts. Uh, dance, theater, gymnastics, uh, different things we can do with our bodies. Um, also building our fine motor dexterity, right? Uh, knitting, pottery, different things like that. Also what I found when, um, you know, videos and webinars were happening, I realized that uh, we can use it to improve our body language because you realize if you can see yourself on the screen, I can't see myself right now. I can only see the PowerPoint, but you realize that, hmm, I was slouching a little bit or my gosh, uh, that video shows that I use my hands way too much. I need to calm my hands or keep them in my lap. Um, so different ways you can improve your body language. I, I think that also speaks a lot about you when you have good posture, um, I think it's good for your health and it's also something that gives you a lot of self-confidence. Um, being in sync with your body, that's also really important. Um, you can link that to interpersonal intelligence, but really what is your gut feeling about things? You know, um, Are you tuned into your um, intuition? And that also has, right? Uh, 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 it's related to your gut feeling. Is there anything that kind of gives you a visceral re reaction? And if it does, why? You know, look into that a little bit. And that can also become an intrapersonal as well as a 
bodily kinesthetic and um, exercise. And um, I had done a workshop, I attended a workshop called um, uh, you know, Heal Your Life. And Louise Hay um, has this entire list of different ailments and conditions and diseases and how they're all linked to the different thought processes. So um, most of them are psychosomatic um, uh, diseases. And she calls a disease a dis-ease of the mind. So when we can ease our mind, we can heal our bodies. And that's the entire mind-body connection. There's so much to say about that, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, but here are some apps that might help you. Um, there's some apps for dance and choreography. I um, haven't tried them, but I personally like to watch Bali Shake. I love um, seeing other people do um, lovely choreographed routines to, you know, some Bollywood hit numbers. I like watching that. It's on my Instagram uh, newsfeed. There's yoga apps. Um, there's fitness apps. Um, there's even theater. If you want to, you know, improve um, some of your, um, you know, theatrical skills, there's even that available. So we're coming towards the end. Uh, logical mathematical intelligence. We need to ask ourselves, how can I objectively and critically analyze information and become more data wise? Um, how is it that I can use my higher order thinking skills? Um, and critical thinking is really important and it really helps in times like this when you have VUCA times, uh, unprecedented, um, unimaginable times, what do you do? What type of um, intelligences do you tap into to make sense of what it is that we have to do? Um, when I look at it in the uh, reflection of habits, well, I think that this lockdown has helped us all reprioritize our goals. Um, habit number three, putting first things first. Um, also evaluating choices that we were making. Were they the right choices for us? Do we need to look uh, revisit them? Do we need to um, reshape them and rewrite them? Um, when we look at Sharp and the Saw, um, I think as educators, um, for all from the education fraternity, Bloom's taxonomy, and we always use that as a reference, right? It's about understanding. Um, it's not about recall anymore. Content doesn't matter. It's really about those transferable skills. How is it that we can apply those skills? And now we're living in an age of information where information is like always bombarding us. It's like the air that we breathe and we need to really monitor what type of information comes into our psyche and settles into our bodies. Um, is it good for us? Is it true? Is it fake news? Um, do I let this, you know, um, uh, you know, psych me out? Um, is it from a valid resource? Where is the research to back this up? Uh, how credible is the source in which it's coming from? And I think that this is one of the worst things about this age of um, technology information that we live in, that there is so much negative or false news or hateful news that is circulating. And we need to be able to evaluate it uh, and analyze it with critical thinking skills. So again, going back to Bloom's taxonomy, how is it that we can synthesize and create something uh, new with the information that we have? So information is there in abundance, but it's more about what is it that we do with this information that is really, really important and how valid, how sound is this information? So for example, this um, you know entire presentation, I started out with the yin and yang, and it's really about synthesizing the habits and the multiple intelligences and how we can actually um, harness the two to make it work for us and how we can build our spectrum of human potential with it. So in logical mathematical, we can also develop our mental sharpness. Um, we can do puzzles, chess, strategy games, um, mystery games, riddles, anal uh, uh, um, uh, analogies, uh, coding. I think when we're working professionally, it's very important to be data driven. Um, it's very important to back your things up with research, um, like I had shown in my book called Brain uh, ABCs of Brain Compatible Learning. And also just discover different algorithms and formulas that work for you. After all, we learned that in uh, our logical mathematical space. These are some apps that were curated. 
um, that maybe we can try. There's a lot of um, cognitive impairment uh, and um, you know they, they talk about being more mindful, um, memory loss is there. And those of us who have elderly relatives, I mean, it's, it's very frightening, it's very sad to see them, you know, um, uh, have that cognitive impairment. Uh, and if we wanna sort of protect, if we're feeling forgetful at our age, what's gonna happen when we get older? So how do we keep our mental skills more sharp? You know, so we can, you know, do those little brain teasers, we can do these different um, type of um, logical mathematical exercises and keep our brains um, minds really sharp and strong. So these are some more examples um, of brain teasers. Those of you who want to solve mysteries, um, there you go. I personally did terrible uh, in a mystery room. I had gone with my friends and I realized that uh, solving mysteries is not my strength at all. I think I would have been just stuck <laughs> if uh, my friends had not be, been with me uh, to get out of that mystery room. Okay. So intrapersonal intelligence, of course, um, we're all in social distancing and um, you know physical lockdown, uh, but we still need to ask ourselves, we have our loved ones with us. Um, we have to be really grateful for that. How can we develop our social and emotional quotient? Uh, how is it that we can develop empathy? We need to ask ourselves. And empathy is such a big word these days. So when I had gone to Stanford and attended the uh, K through 12 design thinking lab um, at the uh, Stanford uh, design school, the D school, it all started with empathy. It's about being able to think from the other's point of view, not from your own point of view. How is it that we can enhance our people skills is really important. Now, there's a lot of research and articles that we found that really at the end, uh, when we uh, when it when we come down to it it's not really money that makes us happy it's really our relationships that make us happy how do we invest in our relationships so when we look at it from the point of view of um seven habits well habit number four five and six is all about public victory it's all about working well with other people it's all about optimizing our relationships so if we can think win-win, if we can have an abundance mentality, how do we sort of create that team spirit and cooperation? Um, when we had a lockdown and we had online classes going on, um, you know, the kids were at home, the parents were trying to like navigate that space. We asked them, since we're a leader in me school, we said, you know, why don't you share videos of your kids actually cooperating and participating uh, with you in the home? And you know we had all these videos um, pour in, and then we shared them with parent permission, and that kind of inspired a whole host of other kids to sort of do the same. So they were vacuuming, they were setting the table, they were baking, they were helping cut vegetables, they were watering plants. Um, and there was just so many things because you know there were parents that were home, they're also working online, and the kids are online, and really, and maids have kind of gone off to the village or whatever, and uh, there's no help at home. So how is it that they can actually work cooperatively in a group? How can they synergize? So group collaboration, we also know that collaboration is a 21st century skill. But habit number five, um, you know, it's all about re building relationships with empathy. Learning from others is so important. And really for me in my life, um, I, I love asking questions. I love learning from other people. For me to talk about myself is very boring because I know I've lived that life already. Um, but it's more interesting for me to learn from others. And I would like to know how they do it and how they do it best. And that really enriches my life. Uh, one of the key things in Kavi's um, a book is the emotional bank account. We need to be aware of how are we depositing in each other's emotional bank accounts. And the more deposits that we make with a smile, with that cooperation, with that little helping hand, with you know, empathetically listening, you know, without judgment, without our own filters, understanding where is it that they're coming from, you know? Oprah said that most of the world's problems, all the people that she's witnessed were was stemming from a failure to be seen, a failure to be heard. So just imagine how essential that human need is to be seen and to be heard. 
And when we can, um, you know, build up our loved ones emotional bank accounts uh, or even you know the people who are a little, a little bit far removed uh, you know um, strangers the security um, you know the people who help us um, it is all about building trust building this richness so that we can you know have that sort of security and safety to draw and rely on each other and depend on each other and draw from that emotional rich bank account Okay, so I think that we would not be uh, able to be here together if it wasn't for technology. Um, there's a lot of social platforms out there that I'm sure all of us are part of. Um, there is good and bad to it. I mean, hopefully we're using it for good. Um, there is um, a, a, we, times where I've actually reached out to some friends who are pace, posting very negative, um, hateful, um, sort of divisive sort of um, reposting, I would say, messages. You know, I just privately messaged them. I said that, you know what, whatever you post, you're amplifying it, not just for yourself, but for hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. What do you want to put out there? What do you want to amplify? Do you want to amplify fear? Do you want to amplify hate? Or do you want to amplify love and um, unity and togetherness, you know? you have a choice it's, it's up to you i'm not going to tell you what you should post and not post but i'm just saying just become aware of what it is that you're posting you know and whatever it is that you're saying it's amplified it's like ripples in a pond so that's about social platforms but coming back to um conversation starter questions i want to say that um in my friend circle i'm kind of known as the question queen I love asking these deep dive questions, these um, really, really interesting conversation starter questions that really help you discover um, you know, other people more intimately. And when we can share this around you know, a living room or a fireside chat when you're traveling um, on the dinner table, um, it's so interesting. Any social gathering, I feel like it's not satiating enough unless there's one deep dive question and it's given, a given us a chance to sort of connect more intimately with um, one another. So I'm a big fan of conversation starters. So last but not least is existential intelligence. It's about how is it that I can discover my unique uh, purpose in life? And how is it that I can focus on incorporating it into all different areas of my life? So um, this is um, really important. I think a lot of time in this lockdown, many people are sort of reevaluating a lot of things. When we look at this in relation to habit number eight, it's really, that's what it is. It's about discovering your unique purpose. It's about finding your voice. And for a lot of people, they find this um, you know, with their faith, um, or with their religion, um, uh, or they can just be very spiritual, or they're very focused on leaving a very positive legacy. You know, they, they, they want to have created meaning and impact in their life, and they want to share that. Their existence, your existence, how has it mattered to you? How has it mattered to others around you? How will it matter when you're gone? your existential intelligence. And Oprah Winfrey said that your legacy is actually every life you've touched. And as educators, as teachers, as those who are developing the future, you have one of the most greatest impacts. Um, your circle of influence is huge. It's not just your set of 25 children or hundreds of children if you teach different subjects or if you're an administrator. It is all the lives that that child's life will touch, their future spouse, their family members, their colleagues, their workers, their employees. I mean, it's just imagine how magnificent your legacy can be if we can make it a really positive one, if we can make it a very enriching one. And this summer, this is why I want you to take time to discover yourself, to develop yourself. Because the more you develop yourself, the more greater the impact is gonna be on every life that you have touched, that you will touch. So um, 
we are through with the intelligences and we are through with the habits um, in relation to one another. I do want to make a, a quick point about the multiple intelligence. I know that those of you in education, they have been around for a long time, uh, more than three decades. Um, when we look at the 21st century skills that are required um, to face this unprecedented future that uh, everybody was anticipating, but nobody could have imagined that it would have been like this or we would be going through something like this. But these are those skills, creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication. And I've added a fifth C, which is character because you can't have competence without character. And this is our twin focus at our group of schools, character and competence. So when we mapped it, I, I wanted to ask myself, okay, is, am I, you know, we've been doing it for over 20 years. Is it still relevant? Does it still make sense? And when I mapped it with the 21st century skills, it totally still makes sense. It is totally relevant. It's completely required and it's completely aligned to the 21st century skills. And that's why it's so important that we, we develop that full spectrum of intelligence in our students. But first of all, we need to do it for ourselves. And that's why I you know, wanted to take this webinar with all of you. I wanted to share um, this passion that I have, this compilation that I have gathered over um, you know, last number of years with all of you, because we can make the, better, the, the world a better place through ourselves. The world is inhabited by so many people, but what is our impact in the world? And it has to start with us. Change has to start with us. Living sustainably has to start with us. Empathy starts with us. Love, creativity, all of those things, they start with us. Enjoy it, be enriched by it. And um, very, very naturally, you're gonna be able to enrich everybody else's life with it as well. So this journey into self-discovery, this is just the start. This is just, you know, for you to kind of have an overview, um, you know, a little bit of application apps that you can try out. But I hope that it's going to be a time the next couple of weeks. We don't know when school is going to open. We might have more time on our hands, but it's really a time to reconnect with a place where maybe you all would have wanted to doodle. Hum a tune, feel the flowers with your fingertips. Go outside, listen to the birds chirping, watch the stars at night. Moving into this play space, it's less tangible, it's a more elusive way of being, but there's so much room for beauty, for mystery, for abstraction. Let's indulge in it, right? It can not only be fun, but it's also about helping us make a connection between that intuitive and that logical. Remember the yin and the yang, the active and the receptive, right? The feminine, the masculine, the intuitive, the logical, the head and the heart. Between logic and truth, between what you know in your head to what you feel in your heart, right? So when we discover these playful insights, we're going to arrive at beautiful new answers, but maybe we're going to come up with new questions because of that but we keep feeding the self-inquiry and it's gonna keep us living more fully, more wholly. It's gonna keep us feeling alive, right? So this is your the start of your continued journey into knowledge. So I wanna share back that screen that I started with when I before I started the intelligences. It's blank right now. Please take a screenshot of this. And I want you to just make eight columns and I want you to be able to write down what are your current strengths right now, right? If you're a teacher, obviously your verbal linguistic might be very good, right? It has to be good. Otherwise, how are you gonna make an impact on students if your communication is not good, right? Um, your visual, spatial, the entire spectrum, I want you to write down not only as a teacher, not only as an educator, but as a lifelong learner, right? as you, what are your strengths in all these areas? And then draw a line. And then over the next few weeks, I'd like you to try some of those ideas that we talked about, right? In this presentation that you've seen that hopefully you've been inspired by. I want you to try those and I want you to make a record of them, right? Build it, 
set a goal for yourself. Maybe you know how to do something. Maybe, you know, flexibility was a difficult thing for you, but now you're going to improve that. Sunil, can you just take care of that? Thanks. Okay, so I wanted to just share with you um, my little list uh, of things um, that I had kind of jot down for verbal linguistic, for example, um, I had done a TEDx. Um, this year was something very new for me. I had never been on the radio, but I, I, I was on a, I was on Fever FM. But public speaking, writing articles and essay, this is something that was part and parcel of my work um, as an educational leader, um, reading and assimilating a lot of information. That's also, but a um, few years ago to ask thought provoking questions and dive deeper. I found that very, very valuable in my interpersonal space. And um, so, so on and so forth. Um, I shared with you how I'm trying to dabble in a little bit of um, those artistic pursuits, how I really enjoy, you know, aesthetic appreciation. I've always been, um, you know, into photography. The first time I made it to the honor roll when I was in ninth, my father bought me a camera. And since then, I've, I've just loved taking pictures. Um, and right now I'm trying to sort through about 52,000 pictures uh, on, my, on my laptop and make this 25 year um, you know, scrapbook or uh, coffee table book, sorry, for, for our anniversary. Um, I, I talked about how I'm into symbols and symbolism and we started with the yin and yang and how I derived um, you know, meaning from that and how, yeah, I, I mean, I just love uh, what those symbols sort of resonate. I talked to you in, about studio thinking um, and arts integration and how that can develop more than eight habits of mind um, in, in musical rhythmic. You know, there's choreography, there's fitness, um, but for myself, I mean, I, I love, um, sorry, not fitness, choreography. For myself, I love poetry. Um, I love having, you know, creating different mood playlists for myself. Bali kinesthetic, um, those are some of the things that I've participated in. Uh, Qigong was something very new and different and I enjoyed that. I just know the introduction. I probably want to learn that a little bit more. But I've practiced yoga for more than 20 years. And uh, every time I exercise, I, I have to follow it up with a little bit of you know, yoga. I just love the way it stretches your whole body. And you know, you're just really into your, in tune with your body. And that's the purpose of the asana, right? But I also enjoy different things like walking and Zumba. Interpersonal, um, it's, I love connecting with other people. I take genuine interest in learning from other people. I think I'm pretty adaptable and adjustable in you know, most groups. Naturalistic, I, I definitely lean towards you know, nature being very nurturing. I enjoy aromatherapy. I don't know how to garden, but I enjoy gardens. Uh, I'm trying to go a little bit more organic. I love experimenting with different herbs and I just love to tune into that rhythm in nature or systems in general. Logical, mathematical, I'm a good synthesizer, I think, but other things in math and stuff, I'm not very uh, strong. Um, legal documents kind of give me a headache, you know, so this is something that I can still work on, uh, you know, and I, and I recognize that. My interpersonal, I shared with you, we started with, you know, the growth work. Uh, I talked about my journaling, my biography work. I love reading spiritual books. I've read everything, Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, The New Earth, Gary Zukav, uh, Seed of the Soul, Soul to Soul, Mind of the Soul, um, just the whole thing. And I love um, you know, to read um, Rumi. I love Sufi um, uh, thought. Uh, I, I find it very, very um, inspirational. I'm very inspired by scripture. It's, it's Ramadan right now, I'm fasting. Uh, I'm reading the Quran daily and I'm finding so much um, reverence in it because um, in that, um, you know, God talks about the creation and how we can recognize the creator through creation and, you know, how nature and everything around us are all his signs. Um, I've, I've started meditating. I talked to you about Deepak Chopra's um, abundance meditation. And then existential, of course, that's very personal, but it's about how is it that you are living your life purpose? Um, if I personally want to serve 
uh, God, how is it that I can do it? And I, and I, and I kind of pray that if I can enrich other people's lives, if I can empower other people's lives with knowledge, like I said, be that candle and let others light their candle from it. Um, you know, I pray that, you know, I hope God gives me some credit for that because I think it's beautiful. All the teachers that I've had, all the experiences that I've had, they've really inspired my life. And I hope that in my circle of influence, I can inspire others as well. So this is kind of an overview um, of the different questions that we started each intelligence with. Sunil, can you take care of that, please? So this is kind of an overview of all those um, different questions. And again, it's very good to start with a question um, and lead into it. And I um, conclude with a couple of quotes from my favorite, uh, Stephen Covey. Uh, he says that until, unless you're continually improving your skills, you're quickly becoming irrelevant. And um, he says, the more we use and develop our current skills, the more skills we are granted and the greater our capacity. So this is about discovering how we can increase our capacity. Let's link yourself to your potential, not your past. So your past is your past, but your potential. How is it this entire session has been about how we can develop that full spectrum of human potential? all those intelligences, all those habits. And then last but not least, Stephen Covey says, be patient with yourself. Self-growth is tender, it's holy ground, and there's no greater investment. And to conclude, let's all make a commitment to live fully, to love deeply, to learn, and to leave a legacy. And if anyone wants to visit um, you know, my website for any other videos that I have, um, articles that I have, um, you know, I have the entire um, gamut of multiple intelligence videos and the entire A to Z um, brain compatible learning videos on my website. I mean, they're also on YouTube as well, but that's kind of an easy uh, way to, um, you know, access them. So if anybody wants to find out a little bit more about brain compatible learning and multiple intelligence, they're welcome to visit the site. Okay, thank you, Sunil. I'm gonna... Uh, Ma'am, uh, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful session. As usual, it is a great insightful uh, event to have a very short conversation with you. It's a great learning. And uh, this last one hour session has been really, really instrumental in in knowing things in a better way so that they are easy to adapt, basically. Uh, thank you for that insight, Chima. So opening up the questions, uh, teachers, so I'm, I'm sure all of you want to ask a lot of questions here. Um, yeah, so the first one from from Nikita. So, so ma'am, how do you think um, uh, multiple intelligence concepts can be applied for the kindergarten age group or kids who are like uh, grade three or low? Um, three or so this is more about self-discovery but do you want to uh, divert into you know application in school right now I'm, I'm just wondering I don't want to get away from the context of what okay. this, uh, okay. uh, you know webinar is about because everybody's logged into self-discovery mm -hmm. so um, you know I, I, I would suggest you visit my website and I have um, all the videos on multiple intelligence and their application. Um, I think you can you can start with at any age. You know, there's so many um, multi-sensorial, lovely experiences that children, um, you know, uh, can be enriched by. They're actually motivated more by that, by any more than anything else. Um, you know, they have um, the musical rhythmic. I mean innately it's innate it's in their body they'll move to music you know uh they feel joyful uh they love nature they love because that's why you know uh, i think in waldorf they don't have plastic because you know it doesn't have any texture you know so you want to feel things in nature i don't think that any age is too small to introduce them to this multi uh sensorial kind of experiences so the more exposure they have i'll just keep it at that 
whether they're a baby, whether they're a toddler, whether we're adults, I mean, the more we can enjoy it, but we just need to let ourselves be immersed in it, you know, um, melt into that moment, you know, with those things. And that's when we can be, but if our mind is in one place, our body is in another, then there's, you know, that there's that disconnection. So we'll have the next question. I hope that's kind of a brief answer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. The next one, ma'am, I do want to mention uh, that every uh, participant that the reason why uh, you have chosen ninth uh, as the session for today uh, date is basically when they take home a lot of learnings uh, from this session today, they have exactly 21 days uh, to practice them yes. so that when they get back to their schools, they are completely a different person altogether. You want to add a bit of Yes, yes, thank you for reminding me about that, uh, Sunil. Uh, I, I had forgotten about that from our initial conversation. So I want to thank Sunil uh, also uh, of AdSense because this is his idea. He reached out to me. He's like, you know, can we do it? And I was thinking about it, but then it just kind of became quite big. I never expected so many people would uh, log in. Um, but yes, that's when we were deciding the date. 21 days seems to be a kind of a magical number. I mentioned Deepak Chopra's 21 day meditation, abundance meditation. So they say that 21 days helps you create a habit. And since this um, session was about sharpening the saw, inspired from Stephen Covey's seven habits, we thought, why not? Let us um, create the habit of sharpening the saw uh, in these 21 days. So if you can all start taking out that um, one hour for yourself. Um, maybe if you need to split it up, I find an hour does not work. I think I need more time than that, you know, at least an hour and a half, if not two hours. Um, and it is busy and it is difficult. And yes, I shared with you my, my guilty friend poem. I do feel guilty about it. But then I understand that when I invest that time in doing something that is good for me or doing something that I enjoy, the, the amount of... Um, I don't know, the amount of uh, lovely things that stem from that, I mean, I, I can't describe. And that's why it's, it's, it's so important. So I hope that the next 21 days before June 1st, and we don't know what the situation of schools is going to be, you might be still working remotely, you might be going into your schools. But hopefully, um, you know, you're going to go back a very renewed uh, person. So, yes, the next question. So, Thank you for reminding me about that, Sunil. My pleasure, ma'am, absolutely. So, so ma'am- Start uh, today, teachers. I would suggest start today. Yeah. And the next question is basically on, um, how do we keep up a lot of posit positivity during our uh, uh, schooling days uh, as we, keep up with all our enthusiasm. So how do, you, how do we basically make sure we always stay positive so that we spend, spread that positivity across our working culture as well? By sharpening yourself, mm -hmm. by spending time uh, with yourselves, for yourselves is really, really important. We can never make anybody else happy if we're not happy ourselves. Um, we need to rely on our own internal source um, you know, uh, we need to be connected to source, whatever you may call uh, the source, the divine, whatever. And um, if you try to seek it from outside yourself, you're always going to be disappointed. You're always going to be disappointed. You might not always, but I mean, maybe once in a while, but you can never be dependent on that. You have to, um, you know, build that from within and make your and then these are different ways like some people will really feel happy you know just being lost in that flow with you know art or for some people it would be um music for some people it's exercise and there's those natural endorphins that are released and they feel good and they're fit so when you can take time out for yourself you will be happy you will make other people happy great no, thank you and the next one is, what is the best way to introspect and get rid of our limitations so that we can grow in positive way? Get rid of limitations? Well, I think if that chart that I had shared with that entire spectrum, now you have to see, do you want to be 
master of all trades or do you just want to have a baseline competency in all of them you know are, are you happy being kind of that jack of all trades if you have certain limits like i recognize i have a limit uh maybe in the the logical mathematical i was sharing with you um uh, legal documents mathematics it still kind of scares me but i have to see well is it something that i need to overcome if it's required i work on it but if it's not required or if i have some somebody or some source that is you know helping me um in that or i have a software uh, that does it for me or whatever then you know i i may not necessarily have to consider it a limitation um and what was the other part of the question if you have limitations how do you get over it yes how do we overcome the limitations and how do we introspect ourselves so the limitations is just start with an action start small every action you will reap a habit right and then it becomes easy for you so if you want to tackle it you just start you just do something you know um because i shared the art thing for years i'm telling you i loved i, I did art when i was in high school and then i just left it for so many years for years i had this terrible habit of collecting art material uh paints and pens and stationery and craft material and glitter and oh, all sorts and i'd line up all my drawers collecting all this stuff but i never did it so it was like i had to just do it you know like the nike ad just do it um and 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 you know like when my niece came and stayed with me she's like mommy jan let's go let's do it. she wanted to copy one of my yin and yang paintings by the way and um and then i i sat with her and because i was sitting with her i just did it and i shared with you what i came up with in such a short time and i myself was surprised so i think it's just about doing it just do it you know you may not feel like it you may be scared you may think you're no good at just do it you know it's 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 going to you have to fail forward right it's the first attempt in learning we need to redefine limitation and scare you have to fail forward you will not learn unless you try and fail a little bit right failing is about going forward in learning right and no one no baby can walk or run without having stumbled hundreds of times it's okay it's okay to have limitations but we just need to go beyond those limitations if it's important for us awesome mom and the next one would be what would be the challenge for us as teachers once the schools reopen uh, to the full time online teaching to covid 19 issues settle down and uh, how do we tackle them so that's why i'm asking you all it's going to be a very trying time we don't know what it's going to bring we don't know how long it's going to last and that's why i'd like you all to use this summer these next 21 days to really really uh empower yourselves strengthen yourselves you know uh make yourselves happy make yourselves strong because when you tune in so even if you're doing online classes you're working with children who will also have had you know maybe they're restless they've not been out they've not seen their friends you know so you need to be strong enough uh and 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 multifaceted enough where you're going to be able to deal with that challenge when you get to it Did, was there any other aspect of that question i didn't answer no, sunil that's, that's pretty much uh, big now and one more question on uh, ma'am uh, rediscover also mean picking your old skills and uh, kind of pursue them um, looks like they got inspired with one of your picture that you have exhibited uh, uh, so they're actually resonating with what which one was that the interpersonal skills uh, image that you have shown ma'am um, oh question starters yeah exactly so this teacher says that it also means probably Uh, picking up your old skills could also be rediscovering yourself is what they're actually talking about mm -hmm. yeah i love those question starters i mean i love it either in in even in professional settings personal settings i i just love questions <laughs> uh warren burger more beautiful question it's a lovely book and it really talks about how all innovation actually stems from a question as well somebody says a great yes, google can give you all the answers right right wrong all the answers are there but only a human being can ask questions 
exactly ma'am so i think uh, one of uh, my personal take away is that there is a lot of information available but how do you convert that to knowledge and then apply it to your benefit is is one take away for me in this particular session ma'am beautifully that's, e that's easy i quote einstein for that how do you convert knowledge right Uh, how do you convert the information for it to become knowledge? Einstein said that knowledge is experience, and everything else is just information. Thank you. Yeah. So going over some questions, uh, pretty basic ones, ma'am. So I'm gonna figure out uh, the relevant uh, ones. Um, yeah. So we have five more minutes for questions, and then we'll we'll close. Four more minutes, and then we can close. Yeah. But we would have been on for two hours then. <laughs> so, ma'am, one more question on um, during self discovery. How do I do the benchmarking? Um, how where did I start versus where do I get to? Uh, what's the best way to uh, get into that mode? Is one question, ma'am. How do you benchmark yourself? Um, it depends. I mean, it depends. Um, maybe if you have a friend. who also has been wanting to do you can kind of you know coach each other uh sometimes it, it always is you know um when you have a buddy you know doing it with you uh you get a little bit more energy and enthusiasm to actually do it uh otherwise some apps probably have some mechanism built into it to kind of coach you to see you know what level you're at and what level you can get to um it depends on what you're doing it's it's difficult to um it's kind of a general question um so many people are pursuing different things um my friend one of them yesterday was talking about how she's trying out every week she's trying out different cuisines and getting you know kind of a sense of mastery over that cuisine a little bit of that culture and her family is probably giving her feedback as to how it's turning out uh it it, it just depends but yes definitely in a social side, i mean we have a social brain right i mean we learn better together than we do by um, by ourselves so even when you look at like nutritionists and all that they always ask you to come and touch base because when you have that sense of accountability that will drive you towards it uh more if you're doing it all by yourself you might become a little bit lazy you know so that's the fear of it So if you're trying to establish it as a habit it's good to kind of have some people who are uh cheering you on or a system in which you can actually put down some accountability for yourselves. Awesome. I think uh Kavi talks about the four disciplines of execution. So maybe you want to uh look that up since we've talked about Kavi. Um so my answer would be to look up that 4DX model, the four disciplines of execution. So you want to get from here to here by when, and what would be your lead measures for that? Taking on one last question, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so um, I think it is more like a point than a question. So while practicing uh, multiple intelligence um, as a as a best practice for the interpersonal uh, related aspect or self discovery process. um it helps dual way one is definitely the teacher herself or himself and also it will also help them implement that really well into the students as well so it's a dual benefit is what the comment is all about on this sure sure why don't we take one last question yes. so ma'am um on the leadership related somebody is asking so how can leaders or aspiring leaders uh, practice something like this so that they actually uh, achieve higher heights in their uh, process it would be the same way as it would be for anyone else right um uh, this is really actually a general session anyone could have listened to this session i did give a few examples uh from education um but really i mean this entire spectrum it's for any human uh right the the, the entire human potential uh for leadership i would say that look at this look at those um intelligences that really come into play uh more strongly right for you as a leader so if it's your interpersonal intelligence how are you going to build that you know what are the habits that are linked to it um you know um 
uh, be beginning with the end in mind, uh, the, the envisioning um, habit number five, you know, uh, about, you know, listening before you talk, um, all those things. So look at what fits into the context of what they're doing as a leader, right? Um, what would be the habits that that leader requires? What would be the competencies, um, the skills and intelligence set that the leader requires? And then based on that, Based on that, um, they, they, they sharpen their saw. Sorry. Based on that, they can sharpen their saw. Awesome, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, Bye, thank you, thank you Sunil, uh, for hosting. And um, I'm sorry that we experienced those glitches. Uh, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. to the participants who were held up, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and with those disturbances. I apologize for that also. No, ma'am. Absolutely, it is. It is definitely not in, our, in your control. Uh, you you did amazingly well as as usual, and we are very fortunate to have this session today. Uh, in spite of the glitches, we did not stop uh, anything. We continued our entire agenda, and we took the questions as well. So basically, none of them have missed anything, and uh, we did not rush as well. We kind of did an amazing work in terms of keeping up to our pace and delivering what we are actually planning to do. That is really, really great, ma'am. Um, and thanks to all the participants. And, and ma'am, 52,000 pictures is, is an amazing journey, actually. It's, it's <laughs> one of not even all of them. Those are the only the ones I was able to scan. <laughs> There's amazing, so many still in my physical albums, too. I'm going to grab uh, one of that uh, coffee, table, coffee table book for sure, ma'am. Uh, art integral been instrumental in, in talking about arts integration, ma'am. Uh, every wall of Glendale Academy speaks about it. And, and I'm really, really big fan of the overall school infrastructure and the way kids are handled. So it is visible everywhere. It's basically walk the talk kind of a stuff. And ma'am, 20 years of practicing yoga is visible in every conversation we have with you. Irrespective of the situations, you are always into the neutral. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Neutral state of mind. And then you also help people to come back to their neutral state of mind and then have a very, very meaningful conversation. Thank you so much for that, ma'am. And talking about full spectrum uh, into the potential development or holistic development to the teachers who are going to become leaders in the future. I think this is a great foundation for all of them to go back, sit and understand where do they stand right now and how do they basically sharpen the saw, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for logging in and viewing. I, ho I hope it was enriching for you. Uh, God bless, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.